video, we're gonna take a pretty deep dive into the internals of the Specialized Future Shock and see what's really going on in there. It'll be part history lesson, part product review, and part bike attack video. So feel free to skip around and hopefully find what you need. The Future Shock suspension system was introduced by Specialized on the model year 2017 Roubaix Endurance Bike as a means to smooth out the rough roads on the infamous Perry roubaix cobbled course. It uses a cartridge spring unit mounted inside of a proprietary fork steer tube to provide the rider with 20 millimeters of axial compliance. The obvious drawback here is that you can't use a Future Shock with a standard fork. The actuation is placed above the head tube, which claims to be better than a traditional suspension fork as it eliminates pedal-induced bob and generally weighs less than a suspension fork. Also, because all the suspension action happens above the head tube, the bike's wheelbase remains constant, which in theory makes the handling more predictable. Now, I don't have the data to validate all the marketing claims, nor am I capable of doing a head-to-head -head comparison between the 1.5 and the new 2.0 oil-damped version, but I can say that coming from a traditional road bike with no suspension to the Future Shock 1.5 is actually really nice. Speaking purely on feel, I notice much less fatigue in my hands and the ride is definitely smoother. My initial concern is that this system would make the bars feel floaty or disconnected from the frame in some way, but I don't really feel that way at all. Because the motion is purely axial and there's no lateral or torsional play, the bike feels very responsive even with the 20 millimeters of motion. Okay, so let's get into the inner workings of the Future Shock 1.5 system. The first thing that I noticed is that because the headset preload and clamping happens lower in the system, there's actually no need for a traditional headset preload top cap. In other words, the stem top cap is purely aesthetic. So on the Future Shock like this one, the top cap is actually blank, which is a pretty clean look, but the question is how do you get it off? I was certainly puzzled by this when I first got it. Based on the fact that it's totally smooth and there's no edge to grab a hold of, I assumed it just pried off. So I tried sticking a small screwdriver in the tiny gap between the pinch bolts of the stem, but it wasn't budging. So I concluded that it had to be threaded. And so using some channel locks by themselves would definitely damage the finish. So I put a couple of layers of 3M double stick tape on the inside of the jaws and very carefully tried to grip the edge of the cap. And at first it didn't budge, so I tried a bit harder. And after the third or fourth try, it finally broke loose. And even with the padded tape, I managed to nick the finish a bit. I was really surprised to see that the entire cap screws onto the Future Shock by this little threaded shaft in the middle. To be honest, I'm surprised it didn't break. And there's this rubber O-ring, which to me indicates that it's just supposed to be snugged down by hand, especially since it's purely cosmetic and really serves no mechanical purpose at all. It's actually kind of insane how tight this cap came from the factory, especially since you can't service the Future Shock without taking it off. Removal of the top cap allows for removal of the stem, which allows access to the future shock, which we'll look at next. Anyways, the top cap mystery is solved. The next part is to remove the stem, which is pretty straightforward. You just loosen the pinch bolts on the side and it'll slide off like any other threadless stem system. Now you have to note that there's this metal sleeve which serves as an adapter since the future shock is a smaller diameter than a standard steer tube. This allows you to use any standard stem with this system as long as you use the right sleeve. Also note that you can adjust the height of the stem to dial in the stack if you wish. There are additional plastic shroud things that allow you to adjust the height without any awkward gaps, but more on this later. Okay, so with the stem off, you can see the top half of the Future Shock cartridge. And if your goal is to just change out the springs, this is really as far as you need to go. To access the helper springs, you need to remove the top of the Future Shock using a spanner or an adjustable crescent wrench. Now here's something that came as a really big surprise to me. Uh, when I opened my Future Shock initially, there was actually no helper spring installed at all. And I looked in my owner's manual bag and sure enough, all three helper springs were in there. So I chose to try the mid-weight spring for starters. And it's pretty easy to swap these out if you want to change them up later. Now once you install the spring you want, you have to screw the cap back on and that's how you change the helper springs on the Future Shock. You should also know that the different helper springs are based on rider preference and there's no optimal spring or sag settings to speak of like on a mountain bike. The Diverge comes with progressive weight springs while the road oriented bikes like the Roubaix come with linear springs. And I keep saying that these are helper springs because the main future shock spring is actually inside of the cartridge and it can't be modified. This means that in theory you could ride with no helper spring at all and you would still feel the future shock actuating. Now if your goal is to service the headset or remove the future shock, this is how you do that. To remove the Future Shock cartridge, you loosen this pinch bolt and the entire unit just slides out. 
Notice that the fork steer tube just ends above the head tube and is extremely short compared to a standard threadless headset system. This is one of the main reasons you can't use a standard fork with the Future Shock system. Now this is the Future Shock cartridge which is self-contained and not serviceable according to the manual. There's the mainspring inside of this and I'm guessing some linear bearings and other supporting hardware to make sure that the motion is as axial as possible. James the Bike Guy did an excellent video explaining the first iteration of the Future Shock and he weighed it at 307 grams. And it turns out the 1.5 comes in at 301 grams so essentially the same. However, once you add the supporting parts like the collar, the stem spacer, and the funky duckbill cap thing, you're adding nearly 400 grams in total. Now it looks pretty complicated at first glance, but the Future Shock system actually works on the same principle as a standard threadless headset, but the configuration is just a bit different. In the Future Shock system, the preload and the clamping aren't done at the stem and top cap, but instead by this locking collar. The front set screw serves the same purpose as an expander plug or star nut in that it allows for an anchoring point once the fork is slid into place. Once you tighten the set screw down, the preload, which squishes everything together nice and tight, happens with these two tiny 2mm two hex screws on either side of the steer tube. These thread in and push down on the top surface of the upper race, compressing everything together. In the case of the Future Shock 1.5, after you set the preload, there are these outer locking screws that maintain the proper force. In order to tighten the locking collars, you use a 2.5 millimeter hex wrench, but you also need to hold the preload screw in place so it doesn't rotate as you lock it down. In order to hold the preload bolt in place from underneath, the service manual calls for a thin 3 millimeter spanner wrench that you slide underneath to hold it there. Now, my owner's kit didn't come with this and I don't have one at home, so I used a piece of thin plastic packaging material and cut out a three millimeter slot. After all, it only needs to hold the preload bolt in place as you torque the locking collar down to a mere one newton meter. Now, some people might call this over-engineered and I would definitely agree. It is pretty ingenious how it works though once you study the service manual for about an hour and wrap your head around what's going on. Anyways, once your preload is set, this clamp would lock everything to place. Now, in the case of the Future Shock, the clamp also serves to hold the Future Shock cartridge in place. So it's a dual purpose pinch bolt, and I definitely wouldn't clamp it down unless the Future Shock is inserted. Otherwise, you're likely to snap the slit steer tube as there's nothing inside to counter the compressive force. Now, before you reinstall the Future Shock, this is where you'll want to decide which height spacer to use. You've got two choices of funky duckbill spacers to use, and you'll want to slide whichever one you choose onto the Future Shock before you insert it into the steer tube. After you reinstall the Future Shock unit with some carbon grip paste and your preload is set, you can go ahead and torque the single pinch bolt down to 4 newton meters. The manual also indicates that the flat surface of the Future Shock should face the front of the bike. The Future Shock 1.5 has three flat surfaces, so I just guessed. I'm assuming it has to do with the distribution of forces within the cartridge, but your guess is as good as mine. Now once you have the Future Shock and integrated headset all tightened down, you can go ahead and install the stem and spacer with just the stem pinch bolts. Remember, there's no need for a headset top cap since the preload was already set at the collar. When you have your stem where you want it, you can go ahead and thread this little bugger back on, and I'm going to emphasize here, finger tight only. Torque your stem bolts to the proper spec and you're done. Alright, so now you know everything there is to know about the new Future Shock 1.5 system, spec'd on many of the new specialized bikes, including this Diverge Sport Carbon. If I missed anything, or if you have other questions, just let me know down below. Was this video too techy? More than you ever wanted to know about the Future Shock? Feel free to complain down below too. I'll see you next time.